We shall turn now to the chapter which we read together, Judges chapter 2, and we shall look at the teaching of this chapter together tonight. Sometimes when we look at Israel, when we consider the history of God's people in Old Testament times, we can be very critical of them, and we can think of them as terrible in the way that they were constantly backsliding, the way they were yielding to the temptation to go after idols. And we think of ourselves perhaps as somewhat superior. We're not so idolatrous, we think, as they were. But I wonder, are we that different from the Israelites? There's actually many similarities. The Canaanites were very immoral, and the Israelites mingled with these Canaanites. They learned the ways of the Canaanites, and they worshipped the Canaanite gods. They sinned against the Lord. Now, we're not living amongst the Canaanites, but we're living in a society that is also very immoral. All around us, we're seeing men and women committing all kinds of immorality. Our society, our films, our music, our television is full of immorality. We're exposed to it constantly. It's easy for us to learn the ways of the world and without realizing it. Sadly, you and I sin and bow the knee to the false gods of pleasure and immorality. First of all, we see here tonight a messenger coming from God. We're told in verse 1 about an angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord that came from Gilgal to Bochim. You remember, you remember that Gilgal was the place where the Israelites set up the tabernacle of the Lord when they crossed the Jordan and came into the promised land proper. They set up the house of God, the tabernacle, in Gilgal to begin with. But then at a later stage, it moved to the region of Bethel. And this is the place that's referred to here as Bochim. And the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bochim. And the angel said, speaking for God, the angel, of course, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is God the Son. I made you go up out of Egypt. I brought you from that land, that house of bondage, and I brought you into this land, this land of promise, which I swear unto your fathers. I gave it to you. I gave it to you. You've entered into this land. It's become yours. I defeated your enemies before you. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. I'm the covenant-keeping God, the God who never lies. I made promises, and I keep them. But ye, what did you do? I said to you that you should make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shouldn't enter into any treaty with them. You shouldn't form alliances with them. You shouldn't tolerate them. You shouldn't intermingle with them. You shouldn't be friends with them. You shouldn't marry their daughters. You shouldn't um, give your daughters to marry their sons. But you should throw down their altars, destroy their temples. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Why have you mingled with the heathen and learned of them their ways? Why have you joined with them in alliances? Why have you been involved in immorality with the Canaanites? Wherefore, 
I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. God is faithful. God kept his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He kept his promises to Moses and to Joshua. The Israelites were delivered, delivered from Egypt, and the Israelites were given victory over the Canaanites. But sadly, they refused his warnings. And now God is saying, because you made alliances with these heathen people, I will not drive them out before you, but they will be thorns in your sides and they will be snares to catch you. Well, does this speak to us? Surely it does. Instead of being self-righteous and thinking, we're so strong, we can go here and we can go there, we can do this and that. <clears throat> we're not worldly. We can watch anything without impure thoughts. We can indulge in all kinds of worldly pleasures without becoming worldly. And what has happened? The friendship of the world is enmity to God. The friend of the world is an enemy of God. And you and I, we have yielded to the temptations of the world around us. And we have forsaken the Lord. We have bit by bit drifted away from holiness and purity and devotion and the kind of distinctness that we should have. We are to be strangers and pilgrims on this earth, not to be settling down in Vanity Fair and following the ways of the heathen. And because, because we refuse the word of the Lord, God's judgment is upon us. Why is this virus going around the world today? Why has it turned our churches upside down? Is it not a judgment from the Lord upon us? Are we hearing God's voice in these things, calling us to repentance, calling us to purify ourselves, to turn from our idols to the Lord, calling upon us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind? To repent and to do our first works and not to carry on like the church of Ephesus, not to be like the church of Laodicea, thinking, I'm fine, everything's okay, we're doing quite well, I'm rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, I solve that thou mayest see. Put away your lukewarmness and return to me, or I will spew you out of my mouth. So we have here a messenger from the Lord to Israel, challenging them, pointing to their compromises, just as this virus is a messenger to us from God calling us to examine ourselves in the light of Holy Scripture. Secondly, you notice the response of Israel. It's weeping. The children of Israel, when they heard this, verse 4, they lifted up their voice and wept. And the place was called Bochim. Bochim means weepers. The place of weepers. It's good to see people weeping, weeping over their sins, weeping over their backslidings. It's seldom today that we see people weeping. It seems to me, as I look back in my memory, that it was far commoner in days gone by in my early life to, to see people weeping under the preaching of the gospel. But nowadays, it all seems to float over people's heads. It makes no impression. When do you see a congregation like Bochim weeping for their sins before the Lord? Alas, alas, our hearts have become hard. We're something like Pharaoh. 
Every one of the ten plagues made his heart harder and harder and harder, till in the end he gets into his chariot and calls his army together and follows the Israelites right into the Red Sea where he's drowned. Oh, the hardness of the human heart hardened by sin. Has your heart been hardened? Is it growing callous? Do you weep for your sins and grieve before the Lord? So we hear, we, we read here that the people lifted up their voice and wept. They called the name of the place Bokim and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. They came with their sacrifices, their burnt offerings and their sin offerings and their peace offerings. And they looked forward to Calvary and they claimed the blood of Christ. We see here an action of faith. Against thee, thee only, have we sinned in thy sight done this ill. That when thou speakst, thou mayst be just and clear in judging still. After thy mercy, Lord, after thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me. For thy compassion's great blot out all mine iniquity. Weeping before the Lord, do thou with hyssop sprinkle me. I shall be cleansed so. Yea, wash thou me, and then I shall be whiter than the snow. We need the blood of Christ to wash away our sins. They called upon the name of the Lord. They they sacrificed there unto the Lord. They wept before the Lord and they sacrificed. And so we too need to claim the blood of Christ. And yet, and yet, it does not seem to have been that deep. They returned to their homes and life seemed to go on as it had been before. We don't read of any campaign to destroy Baal's temples and altars and shrines. But they went back home and they soon settled back into their own ways. Maybe it's like that with you sometimes. You come to church and perhaps you're moved by a sermon and stirred and challenged. And you go home and you're thinking about it, but after a day or two, you're back into your old ways. It's so easy to slip back into these old ways, to harden your heart and to backslide. Weeping is real, but we must do more than weep. We must change. We must, yes, repent and return to the Lord and put away our idols and turn from our false gods and get rid of our alliances with the heathen and change from being worldly to being holy, to being saints, to be set apart for the Lord. Weeping Israel. Yes, it's good to weep, but we must change. Thirdly, faithful Joshua. Verse 6. We read about Joshua. And these verses, uh, verses 6 to 10, you can find them also in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua. So the two books are being, as it were, tied together here. And they're picking up... Um, from where the book of Joshua ended. And uh, in the verses that follow in this chapter, it's a kind of introduction to the book of Joshua because it's it's sort of setting out where the, the book of Joshua the book of Judges, rather, an introduction to the book of Judges, setting out what's going to happen in the following chapters. Joshua let the people go. To their inheritance and we're told verse 7 that they served God all the days of Joshua in some ways the generation that came into the promised land with Joshua were the best in the history of Israel 
the most faithful. They had learned through the wilderness, through all the chastisements of God and the directions of God in the wilderness. And they've served God all the days of Joshua and also in the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. Those who had seen the, all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And they didn't just see these things, but they, they were men, men and women who had a personal knowledge of God, who were converted, born again, walking in the ways of the Lord. They had seen his mighty works and they had a personal faith. But then in verse 8 we read that Joshua died being 110 years old and he was buried. And then we read also all that generation, verse 10, were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works that he had done. For Israel. It's sad when the godly die. And it's sad when the elders die. I think back to when I came to Glasgow here in 2006 and uh, the elders and the older godly women that were in the congregation then, most of them have died. Again this week, just last Thursday, uh, Joan MacDonald passed on into eternity. We miss that godly generation. And we who are left behind, we seem, seem so superficial in contrast. We are so, so worldly and so uh, partial in our commitment to the Lord. Whereas these older Christians were so devoted and devout and committed to the Lord. So dedicated to the Lord. Help, Lord. Because the godly man doth daily fade away, and from among the sons of men the faithful do decay. Faithful Joshua was gone, and all that generation they too passed on. So, next, thirdly, we see a generation which knew not. The Lord. A generation which knew not the Lord. Did they not know? Did they not know about what happened in Egypt and about Pharaoh and the plagues? Did they never hear about the crossing of the Red Sea? Or did they, did they never hear about the manna in the wilderness and the water from the rock? And the way God brought them into the promised land and the defeat of their enemies. Of course they'd heard about all these things. They knew these things, but they knew it in a superficial kind of way. They knew it, yes, and yet they didn't know it. They didn't know it in a deep personal way. You see, it's possible for us to know the Bible, to know the gospel, to know about Jesus Christ and why he died on the cross and how he rose again and how he's in heaven, how he's coming to judge the world at the last day. To know these things and yet not really to know them. Not to know them in our hearts. Not to know it experimentally. Not to have knowledge of God. We can know about God without knowing God. Do you know God? Do you know him as your God? Do you trust in him? Do you love him? Do you walk in his ways? Have you experienced conversion? Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Have your sins been forgiven? Are you walking with the Lord? Is the process of sanctification continuing in your life? Are you on the road to heaven, on the narrow road? It's sad when godly parents pass away and their children are quite different. 
How many I've seen even in our own congregation here since I came. Godly parents pass on and their children, where are they? Children that were loved, children that were prayed for, but they care not for God. Children who loved their parents, but they didn't follow in the footsteps of their parents. How many of them I can think of even at this time? Families of those who were godly and worshipped with us here. And they are on the broad road, careless, thoughtless, godless. Couldn't care less about God, really. They loved their parents, but they couldn't care less about their parents' religion. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Another generation arose in Israel, just as another generation arises in our own country. A generation that knew not the Lord. And so, fourthly, we see that Israel does evil. Verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. I am at the end of a Hebrew word means the plural. So Balaam is lots of Baals. Baal means Lord or master or husband. And the various parts of Canaan and the surrounding country had their Baals. Baal Bereth and Baal Peor and Baal Sebu and others. These were the gods of the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Syrians and the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites. And the Israelites came into their land and they didn't destroy the Balaam. In fact, they found them attractive and they were attractive to the flesh. The Baal religion was a fertility religion. The Canaanites, they worshipped Baal in their temples. And Baal was the one who gave fertility to their crops and to their animals. And the way they worshipped Baal was they went to the temple with their offerings. And then they had sex with the temple prostitutes. And this sex with the temple prostitutes was supposed to cause Baal to have sex with his Asherah, or Astart, his uh, Ashtaroth, as it's called here, the female consort of Baal. And this sex between Baal and his female consort led to the pouring down of rain upon the earth and fertility and the crops growing and animals multiplying. And so it was a very attractive religion to the flesh, to the immoral nature of man. And the Canaanites would say to the Israelites, come along to our temple, come to a feast, come and join with us in worship, come and enjoy worshipping, and this will bring fruitfulness, this will will give you great crops and a great harvest and your sheep and your goats and your cattle will increase. It was very attractive to the flesh. Very enticing. And sadly, time and time again, the Israelites went along to these heathen temples and indulged in the filthy, immoral worship that the Canaanites had of, towards their immoral God. But what about us? Are we so very different? Think about all the worldly entertainments that there are today to satisfy the lusts of the heart and the pleasures that are there to wallow in. All the uncleanness of heart and life that goes on today. And God sees these things. God's not blind. 
He sees what's done in darkness. He sees what's done in secret. He sees the heart and the intents of the heart. He sees the uncleanness and God is angry and God is jealous. A jealous God. A God who hates adultery. Maybe we find it strange to think of God being jealous and yet a husband who loves his wife is jealous if she is immoral. It would be very strange if a wife was involved in immorality, in adultery, and the husband finds out about it and says, oh, well, that's fine. Do what you please. Doesn't matter to me. Well, that would show that he didn't really love his wife because a husband who loves his wife will be hurt if she goes and commits adultery. Marriage is exclusive in that sense. It can't be open. Marriage is between two who become one. The two become one flesh. And that love is an exclusive love, a particular love, and a jealous love if there is sin and a breaking of the relationship. And so it is with God. We are married to God as his people. And if we go after Baal and marry another husband, as it were, if we have a false God, and we give to that false God a place in our hearts and lives that he shouldn't have, then the Lord is grieved. He's a jealous God. He's angry. Israel does evil before the Lord. And then finally, God's, God provides judges. Verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. God was angry with them, verse 14, sold them into the hands of their enemies, spoilers spoiled them, their enemies round about had the upper hand over them. Whithersoever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. And the Lord greatly distressed them. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. What a wonderful God we have. A God against whom we sin and yet he doesn't cast, off, uh, cast us off. Yes, he sends chastisements and corrections. And the hand of the Lord was against Israel. But in their great distress, when they groaned before him, he heard their groanings. Verse 18, it repented the Lord because of their groanings. By reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them, he heard their groanings. Just like he heard their groanings in the land of Egypt, under the hand of Pharaoh and the taskmasters. So he heard their groanings again, and he sent judges to them. And he, he raised up these judges, and his spirit came upon the judges so that they were enabled to deliver the Israelites. But alas, when the judges died, they turned back again to their old ways in stubborn rebellion. And God's anger was against them again. God providing over and over again judges to deliver them when they were distressed and they returned to the Lord and then they fell away again. And again they would groan and cry to the Lord and he would deliver them. But again, when the judge died, they returned to their former ways. This is a book that's calling us to repentance, calling us to give heed to the chastisement of God, to appreciate that our God is not locked away in heaven. 
He's a God who's active in this world, who's sending sicknesses and diseases and death into the land to correct us, who's sending troubles and trials and afflictions upon us so that we will consider our ways and examine our hearts before the Lord. He's calling upon us, return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord. Turn ye, turn ye, O Israel, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? So there's a call here to repentance, a call that was addressed to Israel long ago, but it's addressed to the church in Britain and here in Knightswood today as well. Return unto the Lord, and he will return unto you. Call upon him in your day of trouble and he will answer you and you shall glorify him. Our God is merciful, but our God is a father who doesn't spoil his children. He hands them over to their enemies when they go astray so that they suffer until they return and humble themselves before him. And so there's a call here for us to repent and to return to the Lord. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank thee that thou hast given to us thy word, thy word which is full of lessons for us, full of wisdom, full of direction, full of exhortations and corrections, and we pray that we would give heed to what thou art saying, that we would bow before thee, and turn from our sins and humble ourselves in thy presence. Forgive us, Lord, for our backslidings. Forgive us for our worldliness. Forgive us for our indulging the flesh. Help us, Lord, to crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. Help us to cast away our idols to the moles and to the bats, and to return unto the Lord, and to set our hearts upon thee, and to love thee with all our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. For Jesus' sake, amen.